hymn of praise shall be forever Jesus my firm foundation in shifting sands my strength and hope through many fears and failures the disappointments of the past his constant love has held me fast so for Hey, good morning, WSBC. So glad that you're here. I'm glad to be here worshiping with you all. And we hope that whether you're here in the building watching on our live stream right now in this moment with us or watching later on on our YouTube page or Facebook page that you experience through this moment the embrace of God's love to you in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why we're here, to celebrate the fact that Jesus is actually, literally, and in every way giving us his own life. And as we sit here together, as you sit at home with us by the Spirit, we experience God's transforming work within our own hearts. And it is applicable to every relationship and every vocation represented in this room. That's why we're here. God is doing a great thing in our midst and in our hearts. Um, so now I'm going to ask you all to stand, uh, even if you're at home, um, stand with us, and uh, although it's a little easier to hold these guys accountable, um, we'll, we'll stand and join in our call to worship where we declare our intent to God that we're here to experience his life and we're waiting on him to be our God this morning. Um, your parts will be in bold. We gather this morning in the company of the triune God as the beloved disciples of the true Son of God, the light of the world, and the reconciler of heaven and earth. Though we were scattered, Jesus gathers us. Though we were dead, he makes us alive. Though we had nothing but fear and pride, he gave us a family, a future, and an inheritance that will outlast the stars. Jesus became the king of the broken, emptying himself to the point of the cross. His death conquered all sin and evil, his resurrection securing the victory. Now he rules the world with peace and love. Today, we celebrate the deep and everlasting love of God as sisters and brothers of one family, Today we learn as eager travelers toward the goal of perfect unity with our beloved Savior Jesus. Forever and ever we'll sing the praises of Jesus. He is our life, our song, and our joy. Amen. So for all my days I will sing my praise to the King. Though the storms may rage, he is strong to save. He's the king forever, Jesus. My song of joy will be forever, Jesus, who bore my sorrow. life a gift, is death a precious ransom that wipes the sinner's guilt away and turns my night to glorious day.
hearts when shadows lengthen before my eyes. My Lord and friend, companion through the valley, when dearest ones are left behind, his hand We've begun on this series, and uh, Joel helped me last week. Thank you, Joel, for starting us in the Psalms. A few select Psalms that we're calling Songs of Strength, and we're in these Psalms because we have the sense that in the Word of God there is strength for these days as we worship together and as we look at God's Word. So this morning it is Psalm 11. Seven verses, I'd like to read them before we begin this morning. Psalm 11, in the Lord I take refuge. How then can you say to me, flee like a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bows, they set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth. His eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. On the wicked he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur. A scorching wind will be their lot. For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. The upright will see his face. Will you pray with me? Lord, in these days, we need your strength and we need your help. Just as David did in the crisis that he faced in his life. And Lord, I pray that we would find the solution that he found in you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It was a March morning in 1947. William Samio, a New York City bus driver, started his daily route about 6.30 in the morning, and then something happened. He must have been fed up with New York traffic or something. He decided he had enough, and instead of following his route, he just kept driving. Across the bridge to New Jersey, he stopped for something to eat. He kept on driving. He stopped at Washington, D.C. and parked in front of the White House and toured Washington, D.C. And three days later, he was in Hollywood, Florida, taking a dip in the ocean. Free as a bird. Well, except he was running out of cash. So he telegraphed his boss and asked him for $50. And it was then that the cops showed up, two New York City detectives and a mechanic were sent down to, to, to arrest him and to bring his bus back. The, the problem was neither the officers nor the mechanic knew how to drive the bus, and so they arrested him but had him drive all four, all four of them back to New York City. And when he arrived in New York City, Samio discovered that he had become a legend. People across the country sent him fan mail. Newspapers betrayed, portrayed him as a working class hero. 
and his bus driver buddies raised enough cash to cover his legal expenses. And realizing that they were the bad guys, the, the transportation company of New York that he worked for decided not to prosecute. In fact, they gave him his job back and he continued to drive in that same route for 16 more years. What happened? Well, the bus driver explained it this way. New York traffic just gets to you. you, you it's like driving in a squirrel cage. He said, I just wanted to get away from it all. Flee like a bird to your mountain. Run away from it all. Now life has a way of beating you down, doesn't it? I think of midlife. Now we sometimes call it a crisis. I think it's simply a realization that the dreams that you had are no longer going to be there. And that maybe because of failure or maybe because you recognize that you're just pretty ordinary. You, you, you kind of come to an end of it. And that's sometimes along that path where you kind of lose confidence in life. Like, like Mr. Banks in Mary Poppins, uh, he says, A man has dreams of walking with giants to carve his niche in the edifice of time before the mortar of his zeal has a chance to congeal. The cup is dashed from his lips. The flame is snuffed out. He's brought to rack and ruin in his time. Life has a way of just bearing down on you and making it hard. And then you get to old age, I'm getting closer to that, and, and I'm convinced that some of the hardest battles of life come in the senior years. You lose independence, you lose memory, you lose strength, and, and the world seems to be changing around you so quickly and you, you can't figure it out anymore. And it, it's hard as you get older to live in this world, and, and I think sometimes we lose our confidence. But it's not just older people, it's, it's young people, students in school. Well, I guess now not in school, and maybe that makes it even worse. And, and you're trying to figure out who you are and what your future is, and how you fit in, and what clothes you ought to wear, and, and how you should present yourself, and if you're going to make the team, are you going to pass the test, and then failure comes. And then you look at the social media, and you realize that everybody else has it together, and you don't. And pretty soon you lose your confidence. And if it is true for these stations in life, it's surely true in the Christian life. As temptations come, maybe those areas that you thought you had had victory over and, and now you fall again. And, and where you thought you maybe had some confidence, there is no confidence there. Or maybe you, you, you've been excited about ministry in some ways and, 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 and ministering in the church. And then you realize you have to work with people. And, and you have to deal with circumstances and it just gets you down and pretty soon you're not sure you want to even continue and you lose that sense of con confidence. And if that has been true in life, during this pandemic it is certainly true. We are all out of kilter now. Things aren't what they were or what we want them to be and, and we're hunkering down in loneliness and, and sometimes we're, we're not sure we can go out and all of these things come and we lose our sense of confidence. I've been a pastor for 36 years and add five more as an associate pastor. I think I know the church and I, I'm pretty good at running at the church until now. Now I have no idea what to do. You see, the confidence is shaken. And, and when you lose confidence, you become very vulnerable. Life disintegrates in fear and anxiety, even depression. And we're seeing it in our world around. The world closes in. We're not able to relate with people. We, we, we hunker back and down. And we do not experience the fullness of the Christian life that God intended for us. And it's hard to have Charlie Brown's attitude during this time. Charlie Brown was busy with a woodworking project. And Lucy comes by and says... How is the birdhouse coming, Charlie Brown? And he replies, well, I'm a lousy carpenter. I can't nail straight. I can't saw straight. And I always split the wood. I'm nervous. I lack confidence. I'm stupid. I have poor taste and absolutely no sense of design. And then in the last frame, he concludes, so all things considered, it's coming along okay. <laughs> Most of us can't get there. That is, unless... We keep our eyes on God. You see, for the Christian, confidence comes in a firm commitment to the Lord. C.H. Spurgeon calls Psalm 11 with this title. He says, it is a song of 
confidence. And notice it is David's firm resolve that in the time of crisis, he will seek divine protection. The motto for his life is right in the beginning, in the Lord I take refuge. And it is the first principle that we need to apply in our lives and in life's difficult circumstances that tend to to bog us down and beat us down. Am I trusting in the Lord? Am I making him my place of refuge? And you see, whether... We remain confident when life beats us down depends on our focus. Is our focus going to be on the Lord or not? And in this psalm, we see by way of contrast to two different kinds of focus. And notice, first of all, when we take our focus off the Lord, our confidence is shaken by despair. That motto, in the Lord I take refuge, is quickly challenged in the text. The voice says... Flee like a bird to your mountain. Where is that voice coming from? From an enemy? Maybe the enemy. Or it might even be coming from well-meaning friends who say, you should just run away from it all. Go to where you're safe. Get away from the difficulties of life. I think probably it is the internal voice of fear that comes to David at this moment and says, flee like a bird to your mountains. And notice in the NIV from that phrase all the way through verse 3 is a quotation. It's someone speaking to David. But notice as that voice is heard, despair sets in. And despair prompts us to accept the wisdom of flight. Notice the contrast between the Lord and the mountains. Who are you going to trust? The Lord... Are you going to go to that other place? Whatever it is, that place of refuge. It reminds me of Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. You you see, am I going to trust in the mountains or the maker of the mountains? There's the contrast. Now notice in David's life, uh, the situation was that he had already been anointed undoubtedly by Samuel. He was going to be the next king. He had had great success. That battle with the Philistine giant Goliath and he won decisively. And then he had been brought into Saul's palace and he was there serving Saul. And then there came the day when Saul responded with jealous rage and the spear was thrown to pin David against the wall and it thudded against the wall. And at that point, the voice was shouting, David, run, run for your life. It sounded like sound advice, didn't it? And often it does. Go to that place of safety or security, but notice it is motivated by fear, not by faithfulness. I'm sure David felt the force of that advice. I'm just going to run away. But he also felt the call of responsibility. Notice the simile, flee like a bird. What is a bird like? Well, a a bird is a living creature with great freedom, but no responsibility. That's the picture I get. Uh, He can flit from place to place. And, And that's the temptation. Instead of being faithful where you are, Flee like a bird. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Samio, as he f- fled to Florida, uh, left his responsibility behind. And you can't quite live that way, can you? But I don't mean responsibility to, for life alone, although it is that. It is responsibility to obey our God and to live for him. But despair prompts us to accept the wisdom of flight. But notice also despair persuades us that we are helpless. From a human perspective, the enemies are real. The danger was imminent. The wicked was already there with their weapons armed. And they shout from the darkness, you can't see them coming. And sometimes this has been our experience. I mean in the Christian life. As we live our lives and the temptation comes and and we say, where did that come from? Out of the darkness it comes, but I think also that comes out of the darkness of our own soul's despair. Peggy Noonan, the journalist, writes some 
very persuasive things. And, and she reflects on a panel discussion that she'd read about where there were 11 men and women who were asked to answer the question, why are we collectively so unhappy? And they all agreed that we are unhappy because we have lost our moral and spiritual center. Peggy Noonan writes, poet W.H. Auden called his era the age of anxiety. I think what was at the heart of the dread in those days, just a few years into the modern times, was that we could tell we were beginning to lose God. Banishing him from the scene and from our own consciousness, losing the assumption that he is part of the daily drama and indeed the maker of the daily drama. It is a terrible thing when people lose God. Life is difficult and people are afraid and to be without God is to lose man's greatest source of consolation and coherence. It's exactly what we see in our world around. God left out and, and society unraveling and we are helpless in the moment. Notice also despair presents us with the worthlessness of our action. Notice what are we going to do is the question. The very foundations of society are being torn down. The world system is against God and against righteousness what can the righteous man or woman do in such a place? In this anarchy, what is worth attempting? How can we change it? We might as well hunker down. We might as well run. And despair comes in and helplessness comes in. And everything gets very big around us, all out of proportion. Because we are looking at the enemy, the world around. We are looking at ourselves, but we are not looking at God and we are crippled into inactivity. This despair is true in our world. You ask especially the younger generation. There are many of them saying, I'm not going to live to adulthood anyway. The world is going to be all undone. That despair is out there. It is also sometimes true in our own lives. When we get our eyes off the Lord, there is despair. I think it can be true in the church as we sort of forget that we have a Lord who is faithful to us. You see, when we take our focus off the Lord, our confidence is shaken by despair. But notice the contrast. When we place our focus on the Lord, our confidence is restored by faith. For David, it did not matter whether he was on the mountain or in the city, as long as he was in the Lord. And so he continues the psalm in verse 4, after the voice has been heard with a proclamation about God, a statement of correct theology, it is a testimony of faith in the truth of who God is and what God is doing and what the result of that will be. Notice it is a faith in a person. He turns his eye toward the sovereign Lord. In the first part of verse 4, that little couplet there, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. The emphasis is on the Lord. Keep your eyes on the Lord. That will change everything. Notice the Lord is in his holy temple. It symbolizes the presence of God among his people. In the Old Testament, the, the temple was the place where God came and dwelt. And that confidence they had that God was close. God was near. He is here, the eminence of God. He is here, hearing prayer, forgiving sin, providing refuge and for us and this is wonderful the temple of the Lord is right here we are the temple of the Holy Spirit he is right here with us yes providing refuge forgiving sin giving us the help that we need and he's here as we gather as a church that's what this means when we come together the presence of the Lord is here but notice also the Lord is on his heavenly throne. Now there's a different aspect of God pictured here. I don't think it means a different location but a different function. Rather than the eminence of God, it's the transcendence of God. It is God in his bigness. He is greater than any human enemy. And he now ruling on his throne is governing and judging and extending his grace. God is not in the dark. God is not distance, distant. He is at work in our world. 
His hands are everywhere. Someone put it, those who see God's hands in everything can best leave everything in God's hands. Are we seeing God at work in our world? The king is in residence, he tells us. He's not in flight. It's interesting when these words are quoted in Habakkuk 2 verse 20, there, he goes on to describe the, the awe that ought, that ought to bring. Verse 20, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. The fact that God is on the throne means that the voice of the enemy is silenced. The voice of the well-meaning friend is silenced. The voice of fear in our own hearts is silenced because God is on the throne. Listen, pay attention. The Lord is Silence is the enemy. Notice it's faith in a person, but it's also faith in a process. God is doing something. Now, sometimes it doesn't look like it, does it? But this text tells us that God is, first of all, observing, and then he is examining. The idea of examining is, is the idea of, of testing. It is a metaphor that was used of assaying metals, showing the worth. And what God is doing right now, observing and examining, will divide all of humankind. Notice the, the initiative is with the Lord. He is the one who is observing. And it, it, it suggests in this text his, his gazing intently, uh, where it says his eyes examine them, could well be translated his, his eyelids examine them. It's kind of an interesting statement. But how do eyelids examine squinting, attention. And we have an infinite God who can pay attention to every life of every human being here on earth. And even though it does not look like he's doing anything, he is. Because in his patience, he is giving opportunity for both the righteous and the wicked to show what they are made of. Someone put it this way, Life is a grindstone. Whether it grinds you down or polishes you up depends on what you are made of. Notice the, the testing that happens here. He examines, tests the righteous. And with that test, there is a polishing. Uh, now, it might involve hardship. There are difficult things, life beating you down. But for the believer in Christ, it culminates in purity, it culminates in devotion to Christ. I read the story about a, a man who was flying on business, and he flew a lot. He'd been in a lot of airplanes, and, and every time uh, he just kind of hunkered down and enjoyed the flight. But this particular flight, he couldn't help but comment to himself, I cannot believe this flight crew. They are the most attentive, responsive flight crew that I've ever seen. And so toward the end of the flight, he stopped one of the flight attendants and, and said, excuse me, I, I, I don't mean to bother you, but I fly a lot. And I have never seen a flight crew like this. You are the most engaged, enthusiastic, service-oriented flight crew that I have ever seen. And she leaned down to him and whispered, well, thank you, sir. But for what you shared, you can thank the woman back in seat 12B. She glanced that way for a moment and then said, you see, that woman in 12B is the head supervisor for all the flight attendants for our airlines, and she's on our flight. You see, when the supervisor is there, service is a bit better, isn't it? Our Lord examining us. It's not a negative thing. It just means that purity comes in our lives. Uh, service for him God observing us. But notice the contrast here. The testing of the wicked. Here it's not a polishing, it's a grinding. And it's those who are not clothed in Christ's righteousness. And notice the characteristic of these people is that they love violence. And you, you say, well, well does every non-Christian that, that doesn't have Christ in their life love violence? I think it's subtle, but I think the answer is yes. You see, when we live for self rather than for Christ, it will always mean that others are pushed aside violently. 
Oh, it's more subtle than what, what sometimes we see. I mean, we see violence in our world all the time. Watch our, our news media, watch, watch our entertainment, watch our video games, even sports. Watch it in the streets. And, and hear in our words the, the anger, the, 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 the cutting people down. It happens all of the time. But notice verse 6. An allusion to Genesis 19. On the wicked he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur. Genesis 19 is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Fire and brimstone. And throughout the scriptures, it becomes a perpetual reminder of the sudden and final judgment. Jesus uses it in his teaching, Luke 17. We find it in Jude, verse 7. And also this text found in 2 Peter, chapter 2, verse 6. If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless... For that righteous man lived among them day after day, was tormented by, in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly, godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. God is at work. He is examining and someday that scorching wind of his judgment will come. Uh, it's interesting that wind is, is undoubtedly the Sirocco winds that blew off the deserts. It's actually the same concept as the Santa Ana, Santa Ana winds that blow in California. I'll just leave that there. A, a picture of God's judgment. And why? Well, it says he hates with a passion the wicked. Oof. That's a bit hard to hear, isn't it? It really means his, his soul hates uh, I, I think I, I say it that way because it's the idea of a person. It's a person in and, and, and the sense that he cannot have a personal relationship with those who reject him. And that is indeed what we were created for. And, and when that relationship is withdrawn, that is judgment itself. But it sounds so harsh. Uh, in her book, The Crucifixion, Understanding the Death of Jesus Christ... Fleming Rutledge acknowledges the difficulty that modern people have with the concept of God's wrath. But she says there's no turning from this prominent biblical theme. But then she goes on, but we kind of understand it because we have wrath too. In fact, that's the slogan of our times. Why is there not more outrage? And, and, and in the social media, uh, we talk about all kinds of things that annoy us, and, and we all ought to be mad about it. And actually, we are living in an angry culture. The outrages, of, outrages though, against God seem to go unnoticed and unaddressed. If we are resistant to the idea of the wrath of God, we might pause to reflect on the things that make us angry. All of us are capable of anger about some things, and in fact, we are all angry about things, and usually a, a bit of self in there. But with, with God, there is nothing of self. With God, it is always to maintain His justice and to reach out to those who have no privileges. And the wrath of God is not an emotion that flares up from time to time as though God were having a temper tantrum. It is a way of, it, of describing his absolute enmity against all wrong and the fact that he has come to set matters right. In the end, we will be glad for God's wrath because he will make everything right. So the process is going on. Can we trust him for it? And it is faith that sees that process and sees God at work and knows that all things will be well. Because notice in the end, in the end it is faith in a product, an end product. And the end product comes from God's nature and his will. Notice verse 7, for the Lord is righteous and he loves justice. He is righteous, it's God's nature, it's who he is. He loves justice. It's God's will is what he does. 
And God will accomplish his justice in our world. We hear a lot about justice these days. And I think that Christians ought to stand for justice because our God will. Ultimately, all will be made right. But notice the end product is also a fulfillment of a promise. The upright will see his face. It's the worthy goal, isn't it? In fact, that's what we were created for, this fellowship with God. And as those who are righteous before him through the work of Christ, we will see his face. I think it means that we will see God in this world, in the worship of this life. Uh, D.L. Moody said, we ought to see the face of God every morning before we see the face of men. He lived in a very different day. I, I would paraphrase it this way. We ought to see the face of God every morning before we see the news on the news channel or the news from our social media feed or our internet. Be very careful about what you're focusing on and it's easy to be distracted. See the face of God. But I also believe that means that when we wake from death, we will see him face to face. Paul writes to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Face to face with Christ my Savior. That's what we have to look forward to. We live by faith in that. And in the midst of a, the difficulty of life to put our focus on the Lord and, and live with confidence. Dio Moody also put it this way. He said, I, I prayed for faith and thought that someday faith would come down and strike me like lightning. But faith did not seem to come. But one day I read in the 10th chapter of Romans, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I had up to this time closed my Bible and prayed for faith. And now I opened my Bible and began to study, and faith has been growing ever since. It's the focus. Where shall we focus? When life is beating us down, what can we do? Keep your focus on the Lord. In the Lord I take refuge. That is my constant motto, my conviction. And when confidence is shaken by despair, let it be renewed by faith again. A couple psalms later, Psalm 16, the, the psalmist David says this, verse 8. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. That is confident living. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I pray that today we would keep our eyes on you. Not being distracted by the enemy's advice. Not being distracted by the fear in our own hearts but longing to live in your presence, to see your face, and to live for your glory. Lord, make us confident Christians, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam and the mountains quake in their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in an uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought upon the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted above the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Please stand. Fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me his turn our eyes to you this morning. You are the author and perfecter of our faith. Lord, we come in the name of Jesus this morning and we worship you. We worship the fact that we have this incredible grace. We worship you, the author of grace. i 
Well, we have a couple things for you to be aware of. Last week, last Thursday, we started off the core class. And it's on Thursday nights at 6.30, just for about an hour. Um, we are offering that class in person and online. So we're going to live stream that on YouTube every Thursday night at 6.30. Uh, it will be there. Even if you can't make it on time, it will be there uh, for you to catch up and be a part of it. So let me encourage you to to join and be a part of that. Registration is good for us to know who you are and, and how you're with us, whether in person or online, uh, because in a few weeks, uh, we will split up the teaching portion with some small group time, uh, and we're going to do that online through Zoom so we can have some time to discuss and reflect and to apply what we're teaching. Right now, we're in a block where, where Timothy is teaching and leading us through 
uh, the biblical theology of the Son of Man, Jesus' favorite term that He used to, to call Himself. And so we're going to take the next three more weeks uh, to discover how and the richness of this, um, this title that Jesus used for Himself. Um, so, be a part of that. Um, let me also remind you that next Sunday is our business meeting, and we are meeting in person for that, uh, September 27th at 5 o'clock right here. Uh, please uh, register RSVP for that. There's a, a short form uh, just so that we can gauge who will be here and how many and all that kind of good stuff. And then lastly, let me just also encourage you to pray. Uh, we have wonderful opportunities throughout the week. Uh, women on Zoom prayer is Mondays at 8 p.m. in the evening. Uh, men, we are meeting on Wednesday mornings at 8 a.m. just for about a half hour to pray together. Uh, midweek kind of kickstart to all that is going on. And then if you are available, uh, you can always gather on the patio on Wednesday afternoons uh, from one to three to pray for our church, to pray for our neighbors and our community, and we are encouraging our neighborhood to also come and seek prayer as well. And so we'd love to have you be a part of that, that prayer team too. Okay, would you stand with me as we close out this morning's time in worship? <clears throat> May your days uh, be filled and every moment with quietness, light in your darkness, strength in your weakness, grace in your meekness, joy in your gladness, and peace in your stillness. Go in the confidence of God's presence and His strength in you and through you this week. Amen. <clears throat>